Hello and welcome to the first Climate Detectives webinar. I am Fatima Pinto, I am Vera Foxkuba, and we are here at European Space Research and Technology Center in the Netherlands. This is the largest center from the European Space Agency and it's here that most of its projects are born. Today we are joined remotely by more than 400 students and teachers from across Europe. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Also with us we have Paxi, the Easy Education mascot that you think that perhaps you all know. And before we keep going, we have just some general information for you. So this webinar is being recorded and it will be published later online. You can also use the chat to put your questions. Vera will moderate it. Through the registration form, we have received great questions. We will answer some of these questions during this webinar. Some questions that are more specific, we will answer later by email. So today we will explore different topics about weather and climate. We will learn how scientists investigate climate and climate change. And we also discover what we can all do to help lessen climate change. And for that, we will be joined remotely by a real expert, a climate scientist, Dr. Natalie Douglas. Natalie is a teaching and research fellow at University of Surrey in the UK and she's doing research in data assimilation that has implications in climate change. Welcome, Natalie, and thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. Natalie, before we start, and because we are very curious, could you tell us a bit more about what are you working on and how you became a climate scientist? OK, sure, yes. So um, I am a mathematician which means that I really like maths, but also I've had a, a long education in maths. Um, I studied A-levels in, in maths and further maths. I went on to university to do a degree in maths, and I also did a, a PhD in maths, and specifically that's fluid dynamics. Um, this is a picture of me uh, graduating with my PhD a few years back. Um, and fluid dynamics is important to climate change because um, the atmosphere is considered to uh, be a fluid. Uh, so a fluid includes uh, gas and liquids. So the atmosphere and the way it moves is basically fluid dynamics. So it's very important. Um, I'm currently a teaching fellow at this university, which means um, I teach. Uh, one of the modules I teach is called Numerical Solutions to Partial Differential Equations. Now, this, that's a quite complicated title, but it is very relevant to climate change as well. Um, and I've been a teaching fellow for five years, but now I'm also a research fellow as well, which means as well as teaching, I do research. And my research uh, has a, as a part in climate change. And I am funded by the NCEO, which is the National Center for Earth Observation. And they fall under the, uh, the Natural Environmental Research Council, that's NERC. So we specialize in observation science. Um, our activities include designing models, designing satellites, and um, combining data with models, which is called data assimilation. And because of those activities, um, we're, we're key players in cl climate change in the UK. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, it seems that we are with struggling with having you in the camera. We are trying to see that. Yeah. Uh, I think we are having some problems showing your screen. Uh, but it, I think all the teams, they can listen to us very well. Oh, okay, you can hear me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Let's, we are just trying to see if we can now see you perhaps in different conditions, because mm -hmm. we'd like, of course, all the teams to see you <laughs> <laughs> together with your presentation that we know that you have prepared for us. Yeah. So we are just here trying to see if we can solve this issue. Is there anything I can try from this end? Um, you are sharing your screen already. Yeah. So you've just lost my picture. Okay, one second, please. We are trying to okay. um, well, I can, I can tell you a bit about my current project while we're waiting. So um, what I do um, as part of the research for NCEO is I take uh, data from satellites that's been processed by uh, another researcher somewhere else. And the data is albedo data, 
which tells me something about um, the surface reflectance. So how much energy is reflected from the surface? Um, uh, my particular field is from a canopy. So I take data from all, uh, all, over, all over the world, canopies all over the world, and I use mathematical models to try and get back how much leaf there is um, in that canopy. Now, leaves are, the amount of leaf in a canopy is very important because um, it gives you an indication of how much carbon is stored. And that's also very important for climate change because the more carbon is released, uh, the worse climate change gets. And we'll speak a little bit about that later. But uh, that is my current project. Thank you, Natalie. We are still here then. Try to see. So I think that we just try, yeah. One so more minute that we we'll try to see everything what then is happening here. I, I can actually see myself if that helps. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We can also see you. Okay. But um, on the our um, participants cannot see you, unfortunately. They can uh, only see us, and we would like them to see you too. Yes, <laughs> of course. Um, let me see. So we'll just try to see here. So we just. Ask everyone just 30 more seconds. Okay. Trying to see what's going on. Would you like me to um, talk a little bit about the science side of things, the climate change while, while we're waiting, or would you prefer to wait until? I think we can just perhaps try to see. So we have, in, perhaps we can also ask our teams if they can uh, mm -hmm. see us. Yeah, I think they can see us, but they cannot see you. Okay, sorry, one more minute, and then we'll, if you go here, settings. We must have different settings yeah. than we have yeah, here. Uh, sorry, everyone. Let's see if it's here. Let's try. Otherwise, we'll have to, to continue just without the team seeing you, which it's really a pity. But we could share your screen. We put Natalie in big mm -hmm. and yeah. share so we can see Natalie. Yeah, so perhaps what we'll try to do is to share my screen and like that teams will be able to see you mm -hmm. uh, in a different way. <laughs> okay, we will try this now. Yeah, Sorry exactly. everyone and thanks for waiting. <laughs> Okay, so I think now it should be okay. Yeah, exactly. So I think that now teams can see you, Natalie. Okay. So yeah, and then and then they will also be able to see your screen. So I think now we can yeah. uh, really start. So thank okay. you all for, <laughs> for waiting a little bit, and uh, thank you all for for still being there. Thank you also, Natalie, for for waiting. Uh, a little bit more. So you were telling us uh, about the fact that you have studied mathematics, that you are a mathematician, but that you can also study climate being a mathematician, and that is something oh, yeah, really yeah, yeah, uh, amazing. Uh, so we have one climate detective team, the CNCC4 team, that they share with us their first results. And by analyzing climate data from the last 50 years, they found an increase of 1.5 degree in the average temperature, and a decrease of about 200 millimeters in annual precipitation. They are asking if these are normal values in the climate change trend. Can you explain this to us, Natalie? Uh, yeah, okay, so um, they could be anomalies, but they could also be attributed to climate change as well. Um, the important part of this, I believe, is to understand the difference between weather 
uh, climate variability and climate change. So uh, weather is um, the, the instantaneous type of thing. So the day to day, what's happening outside your window, what the weatherman will tell you, uh, the weather's, what, what that's going to be like today. And now climate is, is different to this. So climate is more like the long term trending of weather or a long term average of weather, um, something um, that you measure over a much longer time. Now, um, climate variability is uh, where climate changes on a um, on a time scale that is smaller than uh, what you would see climate change operating on. So uh, just like weather can vary um, hour by hour, climate can vary um, over uh, months and years. Um, so uh, that's what we call climate variability. Now, climate change is the change that we see happening on a on a much longer time scale. So. Um, from uh, decades to millennia. So um, the, these changes, it is possible to see those, and it could be because of climate change and it could be because of variability. Now, uh, when you talk about um, historical climate change, going back to when the Earth was born, let's say, uh, we call this paleoclimate. So um, I have a diagram here uh, that shows paleoclimate. Now, this is the uh, average global temperature of the Earth going back 500 million years. Now, uh, we, we didn't take the temperature of the Earth back then. There's all sorts of science that can lead us to these conclusions. But what you'll notice is that the, uh, the time scale is quite complicated. It's a change in time scale. So uh, down this end, this is uh, going from uh, five, 500 million years to 100 million years ago. And this time scale changes. Now, what you can see here is uh, some climate change and some climate variability, which is all natural. So um, this could be caused by uh, solar activity or volcanic activity. And um, if you go on to uh, much more uh, recent years, so uh, because this scale has now changed, uh, you can see the, uh, the variability on, uh, say, like a, a zero to 5,000 years ago. So just popping up and down here. Uh, the issue is uh, that these projections here are showing something that's much different to what we're expecting. So this is a projection for 2050 and this is a projection for uh, 2100. And uh, it's showing something quite alarming. Now, if we go to uh, something more recent, so the next picture, uh, this shows you um, a, uh, a graph from the Met Office. So the Met Office is the meteorological office in the UK. It's the UK's National Weather Service. And this is a, a graph to show the uh, average temperature anomaly. Now, what the anomaly is, is the difference between the annual average temperature and a base temperature or a reference temperature. Now, the reference temperature you can see here. So they've taken a reference period between 1961 and 1990 and calculated an average for that whole period. Now, if you then compare, so that's so the 1960s, about here to, uh, and then 1990 is over here. So they worked out the, the te temperature average for that time, and then looked at the difference between that temperature for earlier years and then um, the later years, up to 2016. So you can see that the average before was much lower than this reference temperature uh, of some amount lower, sorry, I shouldn't say much lower because actually it's, a, it's only um, a matter of half a degree, which does make a difference. And we can see going uh, up to 2016 that the temperatures are going up to one degree above this reference temperature. So um, we're, we're seeing something, you know, um, that, that's suggesting something else is at play here. So um, what scientists are attributing this to at the moment is, is uh, gl uh, global warming. So what is global warming? So the next picture shows you uh, the greenhouse effect. Now, um, the, the greenhouse effect is where um, energy from the sun is coming into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, some bounces off the Earth's at atmosphere, but some enters the atmosphere, um, reaches the Earth and, and warms it up. Now, um, the uh, via evaporation, some of that energy can come back out. But if you've got these greenhouse gases, so that's anything, so that's carbon um, dioxide, methane, water vapor, ozone, these kinds of things, they're present in the atmosphere. They absorb this energy. 
And now they serve to, to reflect some of this energy back to the earth again, causing this trapping effect, much like a, a greenhouse uh, when you're growing plants outside. So that's why they call that the greenhouse effect. Now, if you have too many of these greenhouse gases, then uh, this effect worsens. and We, we see uh, a warming of the planet, just like we saw on that graph just now. So too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, too much warming, okay? But um, the green, greenhouse effect was originally a good thing because it warms the planet up enough so that life could form on the planet. But too much, and we start going the other way. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, we have some teams that they are investigating air temperature and how much it rains in their hometown, for example. Other teams are also investigating air pollution, deforestation, wildfires, hurricanes, and the growing of the cities. Can we relate these topics with climate change? Uh, yes, so they all do relate to um, climate change. Um, so um, what's important to, to note here is that um, the, the, the degrees to which these things uh, relate to climate change depend on how, how much the climate is changing. So you might have heard um, at the uh, intergovernmental panel climate change talks, perhaps, uh, they're talking about uh, a difference between uh, 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees warmer. Now, we're currently um, looking at about a 1 degree warming since pre-industrial times. That's where we're at at the moment. So um, at, uh, at 1, 1.5 degrees, so another 0.5, certain um, effects take place uh, that are not quite as severe as an extra one degree. So uh, heat waves is an example of one of these. So um, uh, I'll talk about the others in a minute, but uh, heat waves are just prolonged periods of, of, un of abnormally high temperature. Now what we're seeing uh, with the warming is that these heat waves are occurring more regularly and in more locations. So uh, this diagram here, this is um, showing you, so if you if you think about um, var variability of temperature as it is at the moment, uh, we have some warm temperatures, we have some cold temperatures. Now we take a reference temperature, different to the one we discussed just now, reference temperature where, uh, where we only go above this temperature 10% of the time. So if we look at this diagram, we go above that temperature so, so this dark color here, 70, about here, we go above that temperature 70% of the time in the um, equatorial regions when the planet reaches two degrees warmer. Okay, now this diagram over here is showing you the difference. Okay, so uh, what does it look like at 1.5 degrees compared to two degrees warmer? And there's a difference in these equatorial regions of up to a 20% difference. So if it's, if it's a 1.5 degrees warmer, 20% here is, is, uh, is below that 10% reference temperature. So that's heat waves. Uh, so we're also seeing um, increases in sea levels. So as ice caps melt in this warming planet, um, there's gonna be more water, um, regions that um, are about sea level would be submerged. And at the moment, the sea level is increasing at about 0.13 inches per year. Uh, so that's that's something else we're seeing. We also see uh, increase, but also decreases in rainfall. And this is because of uh, how the water cycle works. And we look a bit more at the science at that in a little while. But uh, so you can have uh, more rain or less rain in some areas. Now more rain uh, with sea levels rising means increased risk of floods. Um, but also uh, where there's less rain, um, you're uh, at more risk of droughts and wildfires, so uh, naturally occurring fires in the wild because, because of the heat. So um, hurricanes is slightly trickier because you have, um, uh, it's very difficult to say that climate change is causing more hurricanes because of how complicated it is to model the weather. But we are, uh, we are able to say that the intensity of a hurricane is increased uh, by the effects of climate change. Um, so, with the growing population and all of these things going on, uh, deforestation will also continue to happen. And um, this uh, uh, forests are actually count counteracting the effects of, of climate change because they remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So uh, all of this, all of these are attributed to climate change, and all of these will continue to happen. 
but alongside this, we'll also see human adaptation. So um, I've I've read about uh, Water Worlds. So you may have seen the film with Kevin Costner in Water World. We might see civilizations living on water if, uh, if there are too many floods, or even um, civilizations living underground uh, because it's too hot. And um, things like uh, genetically modified crops, ones that can withstand um, uh, uh, weather fluctuations. So as all of these things happen and are attributed to climate change, you will see a lot of human adaptation as well. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, so we have a question from the Foggy Hot Detectives. Uh, they are asking, so here in the Po Valley, northern Italy, during summer, in case of stable high pressure conditions, we are experiencing hot and humid periods associated with high pollution levels. Do you think we can prove a relationship between these two phenomena? Uh, yes. So, um, so I've spoken about uh, the greenhouse effects and how um, the energy and the heat coming into the atmosphere and not being able to leave um, has an effect on the temperature. It also has uh, effects on the way air moves. Okay, so um, here is a picture of a saucepan, which is relevant, but you'll see why in a second. So uh, this saucepan has some uh, water in it. It's a fluid, behaves in the uh, same way as what a gas would in certain situations. It's being heated. Um, and what happens, it warms the water at the bottom first. And uh, water that is warmer is less dense, so it rises. So you see this, this movement in the saucepan from the bottom to the top. Now, as it rises, it meets, it meets cooler water or moves away from the heat source. And uh, it cools and becomes more dense again and falls. Now, this is a, a perpetual cycle, and we call this convection. Now, the next picture, this is showing global circulation. A similar thing happens uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. So with the, uh, the, uh, the, the equator being, being close to the sun, it's um, so the poles are further away from the sun. Uh, they will get more energy and more heat. So they are the warmer areas of the planet. Now, um, this will cause air to rise and air to circulate in very much the same way as convection in the saucepan, but it is complicated by the fact that the Earth is spinning and uh, the Earth is also composed, composed of, 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 of rock and water. So uh, there are lots of complicated uh, circulatory things happening on the, the Earth's surface. But um, where, where, as I was talking about um, uh, the fluid being dense and rising, uh, this is where um, the pressure um, terminology comes in. So as air uh, heats and rises, we have um, low pressure underneath. As air is moving away, it's, just, it's not as stacked, as there's low pressure. And as air cools, um, it's stacking on top of each other and it's, it's causing high pressure. Okay, so uh, low and high pressure is very much a part of, of climate change as well and, and weather. So um, low pressure is mostly um, associated with um, fast winds, uh, which we talk a bit more about later, uh, precipitation, cloud formation and so on, whereas high pressure is usually associated with calmer weather, so either sunny or um, trapped clouds. And if clouds uh, can be trapped, so can high, uh, so air pollutants, so high levels in pollution in certain areas. And that's why you, you can say that level, um, areas of high pressure can be associated with uh, levels of high air pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have also one more question from the Climate Busters team. They are asking, here in the island of Crete and also in the southern part of Greece, we experience Sahara winds more often than the previous years. This phenomenon occurs also during winter. What causes this effect? Is it connected with global warming? Um, yes, it can be. Uh, so I mentioned just now the, the wind speeds, the high wind speeds with, with low pressure. So um, wind is basically airspeed so we saw in the in the previous slide you have air moving around um, that's that those are your winds okay so the the faster your air is moving the faster your wind is so and that's that's caused by areas of high and low pressure now um, the land heats more quickly than the sea does 
And so um, what you see there is um, this will cause a pressure gradient, okay? So if this is heating uh, more quickly on the land, then um, you've got your air rising, um, creating low pressure, and now um, uh, wind is caused by the air wanting to move from areas of, of uh, high pressure to low pressure. So um, if this is being caused by um, warming, uh, so warming of the land and the earth is warming up via climate change, then that pressure gradient will be larger, causing faster winds. Thank you, Natalie. We have one more question. This is from the King's College Hospital School. How does or will climate change affect the planet and especially children and young people who may have conditions like asthma and cystic fibrosis? Okay, yeah, so we've uh, mentioned uh, various ways in which climate change can affect the planet. Um, it's actually also very closely uh, linked to air pollution as well because they're kind of caused by the same thing. Air pollution is uh, anything that's harmful, harmful substances in the air, um, substances harmful to humans. So um, they, air pollution is actually generated from the same thing as greenhouse gases, so burning of fossil fuels, uh, industrial processes, burning of forests and things like this. So um, air pollution at the moment causes about 6 million deaths per year. Uh, and 25% of lung cancer cases. Now, as long as climate change is worsening, uh, the, the things that are causing climate change are also causing air pollution. So air pollution will also get worse too. And um, it will affect the most vulnerable people first. So those that um, suffer from pre-existing respiratory problems. Um, but having said that, uh, I mentioned human adaptation earlier. Um, we will see a human response to this and government response. So, for example, um, in Japan, they wear a face mask quite a lot to protect themselves from air pollutants. Uh, I think we'd see that more on a, uh, a global basis if air pollution becomes too much of a problem. Uh, we also see maybe, perhaps air filters in buildings as well as air conditioning. Um, and uh, government investing more, more money into medicine surrounding these areas and possibly even um, you know, genetic modification to eradicate these problems in the first place. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Uh, before we check with Vera, if we have any questions from the chat, we have one more question for you from the Little Climate Detectives. They are asking, is it true that global warming is in some way slowing down a glacial period in which we are supposed to be in? Okay, yeah, so um, I'd like to uh, make the distinction between uh, an ice age and a glacial period for everyone listening. So um, we are actually in an ice age at the moment because we have uh, ice, lots of ice in the polar regions. So um, that means we're, we're in an ice age. And the current ice age actually started 2.6 million years ago. Um, a glacial period um, refers to the variability in a temperature when you're within an ice age. So there's that variability issue again. So um, you can have warmer and colder periods within an ice age. Now the glacial period ref refers to the colder temperatures and we have uh, interglacial periods to refer to the warmer temperatures. So within the current ice age, uh, we actually left the last glacial period about 15,000 years ago. And uh, we were expecting the next one to be in uh, 50,000 years. But uh, a recent study, so scientists somewhere researching this area, have found out that, um, that this process is actually very, very sensitive to um, the greenhouse gases. And so uh, human activity has put enough um, so carbon into the atmosphere to actually affect when the next glacial period will occur. So now we're expecting it to be in another 50,000 years on top of that. So actually in 100,000 years. Well, that, that's really mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, so I think now we will try to see here in the chat if we have mm -hmm. uh, any questions. Vera, we have any questions? So um, the teams are very active and we have many, many questions coming <laughs> here. Um, so unfortunately, I just also wrote it on the chat. We cannot answer all of them now. But if your question is not answered um, during this webinar and um, you still have it after that, please 
um, send us an email and we will try to, to answer it. Um, a question that many teams asked is about the temperatures that we have right now in February here, which is very special. I think uh, many teams yeah. also recognize this. And um, there oh, was the question right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so one team wanted to know, is this climate change or is this climate variability? Do you have an idea, Natalia, about this? So it's, it's impossible to know, right? So um, it, it could be um, just, uh, you know, a, a freak uh, few days of weather. So, yeah, um, in, until we have um, climate models that are very, very accurate and um, uh, a data that trends, you know, uh, for a long time and in use of, you know, satellite data with the climate models, it's really difficult to tell what's actually causing this. Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank Natalie. You. Um, so I, we still will have still more moments to, to see other questions from the chat, but now we will continue for a different question for you, Natalie, and then we go back again to, to Vera, to the chat. So we have just learned that climate is observing weather over a long period of time. Can you tell us more about how scientists investigate climate and climate change? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I just um, mentioned uh, models and data. So uh, I'll talk about that for a bit. So uh, firstly, models. So um, anything that uh, uh, models climate, um, uh, mathematically we call it a, a, a global climate model or a, a GCM. And they're based, on, uh, they're mathematical equations and they're based on physical laws. So, um, if, so you can imagine how large the, the planet is and um, all of these things we need to know in order to say something about climate. Uh, these models can get quite complicated and we start off with simplified models. Now, the simplified models must be able to um, describe those large scale proce processes that I mentioned earlier. So uh, the basic ones, would be, um, uh, the, the circulation processes. So um, uh, as I said, um, velocity, so wind velocity, which is wind speed and temperature and pressure, they're all very important things. So, so we need to know information about these these things accurately accurately in order to say something about climate so um, we call these variables um, essential climate variables or ECVs uh, there there are many more so um, greenhouse gases water vapor other things like that also are uh, essential climate variables and we need to be able to uh, um, mod model these use our uh, GCMs need to be able to tell us something about those essential climate essential climate variables and the more essential climate variables we include and the more accurate we want it to be the more complicated it becomes so um, I want to show you a picture now so let's go to uh, this one so uh, climate refers to uh, the whole globe so everywhere on the planet we want to know something about climate so we need to know something about temperature, pressure, and wind velocity everywhere on the planet, but it's impossible to do this every single point. So what we do is we put um, grid cells all over the earth, okay? And what we say is, oh, okay, let's assign uh, values to these variables on the cells, and that will tell us something about climate, and then we can use our models to see how these, these uh, variables on the grid cells will evolve. Now, because the mathematical equations are so complicated as they are at the moment and with current science, we can't actually solve them mathematically or analytically, we say, um, but we can solve them numerically. So we use approximations and ask a computer to do it for us. Um, and now this is um, something that's relatively new because computers aren't that old. Um, if you think about it, they're only a few decades old and um, even uh, younger are the supercomputers. So this is a picture of a supercomputer. So these are the computers that can do very, very fast, lots and lots and lots of calculations. So um, this is the uh, K supercomputer that's in Japan. Um, I was in Japan in January and I took this photo. Um, so um, it, this is not multiple computers, this is one computer. And to give you an idea of the scale, this is one floor of a building. So possibly maybe the size of 10 classrooms. 
So uh, we have these supercomputers now that allow us to do very, very fast calculations and lots of them. So what we can then do is say, OK, well, if I've got these supercomputers, um, I can take smaller grid cells. So I've got more information about the essential climate variables, more locations on the surface of the planet, and I've got a more accurate model. OK, but um, so that's models. Um, this is not enough, though, to tell us everything about climate because uh, we, don't, we don't know how. So a, mod a mathematical model can tell us how it evolves, but we don't know how to initialize it, how to start it off. So satellites, so observations and data become very key in, in, in this part. So um, uh, satellites, very, very helpful for looking at the surface of the planet. Um, this is Aeolus. Um, this is a European Space Agency satellite that is um, going around the, the so orbit in the Earth at 320 kilometers high. And it's taking uh, measurements of wind speed. Okay, so as I said earlier, very important in determining weather and climate, wind speed. Um, there are others. So uh, there's a, a, th a constellation of three satellites, METOP A, METOP B, and METOP C, uh, that are also taking measurements of wind speed, but also of some of the other variables. So uh, this information is now coming in thick and fast with the development of satellites, helping us um, with our models of climate and helping us uh, say something more about the climate and where it's going to go. So um, um, the other things um, that we can do with satellites are produce images. So um, these are uh, this is an example uh, of an image taken um, of the UK and um, various parts of Europe. Uh, there's two images there and they're one month apart. And this is very helpful for uh, monitoring climate. So modeling climate and monitoring climate are both very useful. This one here, uh, what we're seeing on the left is, is um, green, mostly green, uh, changing into brown within the space of a month. So, um, uh, you know, a, a month is quite a, a fast time for, some, for vegetation to be uh, developing like this. And so we can uh, monitor these kinds of processes and say, OK, you know, is it climate change? What's happening here? Compare it to models. What do we what do we put this down to? So um, here's another. Uh, so can you see it? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is a picture above Sweden uh, from a satellite. So what we're seeing here are some wildfires. OK, so also very important to monitor when you're monitoring climate change. And you can see the smoke from these wild, wildfires moving off um, with the clouds. So um, um, this was taken in July 2018. And um, I think they said it was something like three times more wildfires than what they would expect at this time of year. So uh, that's also very important to, to monitor. Uh, these are the kinds of images that you guys can actually source and use yourself. So, um, yeah, it's the, uh, through the uh, Earth Observation Browser. So you can actually do some of your own monitoring, too. Um, so as you can see, uh, I've mentioned various things there, so models, observations, monitoring. Um, the term scientist actually takes on a very broad definition. So scientists could be a, a satellite developer um, or a satellite designer and a, a satellite engineer. Um, a mathematician using the data or um, making models. So, yeah, scientists does does include a lot of people. Yes, amazing, Natalie, really. Lots of information and science is really a huge topic. So teams from the Climate Detectives projects are now doing their investigations. Some teams are, for example, doing interviews, some researching in archives planning field visits, and also working together with local universities. Is this how scientists work? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, very, very important side of research. And also where most researchers start. So um, research doesn't necessarily have to be all mathematical, like uh, the, the science that I've been talking about, or the science that I do. So um, there are lots of other things you can do as well. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, as, as part of research, so you can imagine all those scientists I mentioned just now being involved in, in 
climate change. One single scientist alone wouldn't be able to do uh, all of this research on their own or take say something about climate change on their own. So uh, we have to have lots of scientists working together. So collaboration is key, whatever research you're doing. So uh, collaboration, so getting together with other scientists or other researchers um, working together on this climate change thing. Um, as an example, so um, uh, as an academic, um, I, I am a researcher, but um, I'm also heavily involved in teaching. So I might teach about um, climate change and I might have a, a postgraduate student or PhD student working with me on my climate change project. Uh, my supervisor will also be working on the same climate change project. Um, and uh, we, we might have collaborators from uh, other universities working on the same thing. Now, um, just to give you an idea, my supervisor is Professor, Pr Professor Ian Rulestone, who used to work for the Met Office. He's now the head of the maths department here at Surrey. Um, he wrote this book called Invisible in the Storm. So he knows lots and lots and lots about maths um, and weather and actually uh, using it in, in the field. So um, he, he has worked with many, many different people in this area and learned a lot about climate science and done lots of research. Um, just to let, uh, give you an example of how that might be useful uh, from this, this perspective, um, I go to Redden University quite a lot. I have a collaborator there um, and they have a meteorology department. So um, I'm, I'm doing the maths, they're doing lots of applications um, and then together we might go to the Met Office and offer them something useful and then the Met Office will say, yes, this is great, I'm going to use this. Um, and since the Met Office um, give uh, forecasts to government and military, the government then decides this is a very important area and then pumps money into it. And then uh, money comes back to me and then it starts all over again. So that's how you can see um, research being very important and collaboration being key and part of that. Um, also very, very key is the communication side of things. So um, when you do your research, it's also uh, very, very important to voice it, advertise it, uh, make it known to various uh, different people, also people relevant in the field, because um, people in the field, if they hear about what you're doing, they will tell other people. So it's this awareness thing being very important again. Um, also publishing your results is very, very important. And um, conferences, okay, so I, I learn a lot at conferences. Um, what is a conference? So this is a picture of the uh, United Nations Climate Change Conference. Uh, this was in Germany in 2017. Uh, this is quite a high profile conference. So there's lots of scientists in this audience um, and each of those uh, may have a chance to talk about their research. Um, and this would be in front of politicians as well, right? So there's there's a lot of people at this conference. Most conferences are a bit more low-key. So um, if you don't have a chance to speak, you yeah. might uh, present a poster. But this is where all of the, the climate yeah. scientists get together and they're in the same room and they're listening to everybody's research. And this information is being disseminated and, and the awareness of your own research is, is becoming larger. Um, as I said, um, I mean this is this is quite you know far on in research, um, and this is for you know scientists that have been doing research for years. But you do have to start somewhere, you know, um, if you're doing research um, at school and um, you're you're just learning about research. The things that you guys are doing now is absolutely perfect as the first steps. So. Um, your interviews are really useful, talking to people and learning more, so the communication side, uh, talking to people about their research, um, even creating discussions with focus groups is really useful. So a focus group is where you have uh, more, uh, a group of people and you give them a subject to talk about, and so you stimulate conversations. Those are all really useful. Literature reviews where you find out and you um, summarize all the information that you've, you've found out, even things like those can be published. So um, there are there are many ways in which you can do research, and you're absolutely doing the perfect thing for the the start of your research career. <laughs> good, thank you, Natalie. That is really good to hear. So communication, collaboration, and different methods that scientists and also uh, the climate detectives teams are are doing. 
We have received one question also from Team Diamond 502. They asked, how can we demonstrate the increase of the annual temperature and the decrease of the annual precipitations due to the meteorological anomalies? Okay, so uh, we've spoken a little bit about uh, some of those things already. So um, I mentioned that um, when you're by the sea, so um, uh, higher temperatures mean sometimes that the wind moves faster and you also got your areas of higher pressure and your areas of low pressure and they can be um, associated with um, uh, sort of higher, uh, higher rainfall and lower rainfall depending on, on what the pressure is. So with the low pressure, you, you expect uh, more rainfall and the high pressure, you expect less rainfall. Um, and so you, you can see that different areas will experience these things in different ways. But in the same way that wind can be sped up by higher temperatures, the water cycle, so the evaporation and, and uh, um, uh, rainfall processes in the water cycle can also be intensified by, by climate change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So one more question from the park researchers. They asked if it's possible to find clear signs for climate change in their park school garden. What do you think, Natalie? Okay, yeah, so um, so now we know a bit more about what uh, climate change is and uh, climate variability. Um, so what you are likely to be measuring is climate variability because to measure climate change, you need to see uh, the trends in climate changing, which we already mentioned can take from um, you know, decades to millennia. So I don't think your projects are that long. So um, you you will be uh, measuring climate variability, and it's you know it, it makes it very difficult then to say that these changes can be attributed to um, a change in the trends of climate. Um, what I will say though is that um, you know. Uh, it's very difficult to get data going back decades and millennia anywhere on the planet. Um, the introduction of satellites is making that a lot easier now because they're taking constant measurements all the time. Um, but they're relatively new. I mean, uh, Sputnik was the first satellite that was launched and that was in 1957. Uh, so we are moving that way now, but it is, it is very difficult to, you know, to, get, to get that information for a specific area. Um, so, but I will, I'll also say that um, it can't be a bad thing collecting this data because it will it will complement everything that, um, that's already there. So, and and also you're you're seeing it for yourselves, and you're making changes by making other people aware of it. So, everything is all of this data collection is a good thing. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. So. Before we go to explore what we can all do to make a difference to help lessen climate change, we will first check with Vera if we have any questions. Vera, how is the activity in the chat? So people still ask many questions and I, I think we could answer some already. And many people or many teams are asking what they can do about climate change. And this will uh, we will talk about in, in our next um, um, section of the webinar. So um, maybe one more question for you, Natalie. Now is um, what influences do the humans have on the local climate? Do you have an idea on local climate? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, I guess um, so. Uh, so we spoke about the areas of. So I'm gonna I'm gonna choose air pollution as an example. Mm -hmm. So we spoke about um, areas of, of uh, high pressure being associated to um, sort of milder weather conditions, calm conditions, and sometimes um, trapped clouds and, uh, and trapped air pollutants. So, uh, I mean, climate is more of a global thing, but if you'd like to talk about a local thing, it's very um, dependent on whether you're in a high, an area of high pressure or an area of low pressure. So locally, if you are putting uh, more air pollutants um, into the air, so, uh, as well as greenhouse gases. Um, you are actually, and you're in an area of high pressure, you are actually polluting your own area. So, um, I mean, that, that's not the case for areas of low pressure where the, the weather conditions are more dynamic, you'd expect them to be more dynamic, where air pollutants can move around. So uh, on a, a local basis, uh, uh, that's just one example. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you very much. We have any other questions in the chat, Vera? So we have many project related questions. So um, please send us an email with your very specific questions. Yeah. Okay, so, so far we have heard a lot about climate, climate change and some of its consequences. What can we all do to help lessen climate change and its effects? For example, we have also one question from the music climatologist team that they are asking. Could you also propose a clever and simple way to aware the local communities of the problem of the release of the negative greenhouse gases? Okay, so um, you guys are doing something already, which is great. Um, but uh, we, I mean, we can we can do more, right? So, um, not to forget, right? First of all, that uh, greenhouse gases isn't necessarily negative as we spoke about earlier the only reason why humans exist on the planet is because um, there are some greenhouse gases uh, the only problem is that we have we've gone too far uh, in that direction now there's too many greenhouse gases that we're, we need to we need to put a, a stop to add in more so um, let's talk about carbon footprint for a second so this is how much um, uh, you as an individual how much carbon you're putting into the atmosphere, how much you're adding um, to the greenhouse effects with your own individual carbon inputs or um, as, a, as a company or as a school. So things you can do to, to lessen your, your own personal carbon footprint, and I'm sure a lot of you are do, doing them already, as I know you're already raising awareness, um, but recycling, um, reducing food waste, um, uh, use, uh, using clean energy is is a good one. So, um, how does your school, for instance, um, source their energy? Is it from a, a, a clean source, a green company? Um, that that's a change uh, you can make. Could you turn your school into a zero emission school? Um, beyond beyond that, it is all about raising awareness. Um, and because climate change is a global problem. Uh, you're, we need to raise awareness on a global basis. That's not necessarily you can. It's something you can do with uh, something quick and snappy. Um, so uh, I mean, um, something that impressed me a couple of weeks ago. The kids uh, in the UK, they've all um, walked out of school and took to the streets to protest outside Parliament. Uh, now, I don't um, suggest that everybody quits school and starts protesting, but this really got um, people listening, and even the teachers joined them. So we can see uh, movements in this direction, uh, and I think because this problem has built up over time, it's something that we're going to have to be battling for a long time to to try and combat. So, but uh, yeah, I do I do think um, you know with this increased noise and more and more people making noise about these things. I think this change is coming quite soon. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for your positive message. I think it's, it's very important to know that we can all do something to, to help reduce uh, climate change. And that's exactly what some climate detective teams are, are doing. And we have also some interesting ideas. For example, zero carbon use team is saying, one of the major problems of climate change is the ice on land that is melting very fast. Improving research, can we someday freeze a part of the ocean? What do you think, Natalie? Um, okay, so uh, this is interesting uh, because, I mean, the, it's a good question because what you're thinking about is um, tackling the causes of the problem uh, rather than, you know, the clear up. So uh, the analogy I like to use is um, uh, if your bath overflows, um, what do you do? Do you, do you take to a mop or do you turn off the tap? So, you know, I like this larger scale, you know, solution to this problem. The only problem is it's a, it's a huge thing to be able to achieve, right? So um, if you think the, the problem has been caused because we've effectively created a giant oven. Okay, so we've, we've got this oven heating up the planet and in order to to reverse those effects or to, to refreeze the sea, uh, we'd need to create a giant freezer. So that is a, a huge problem. Okay, and also will we'll require a lot of energy to, uh, to, to achieve. But uh, having said that, there, there is some research into something along, uh, along these lines. So um, uh, there was uh, this, and I believe this was uh, 
uh, it was a Pot Potsdam Institute. So um, they investigate a lot of uh, climate impacts. So uh, what they did was to um, create computer simulations to try and assess if it's possible to pump water to the colder areas of the planet uh, in order to freeze it and to take it out of circulation. So um, they, they did this and they found that actually it would take about 10% of the energy that the whole planet's currently using to do this. So it was quite infeasible. Uh, which was equivalent to building 850,000 um, wind turbines in the Antarctica. So, um, you know, by the time that you'd be able to uh, complete a project on a scale like that, um, the problem has already got worse anyway. But it does, it does uh, give you an idea of uh, what kind of research is actually going on at the moment. And if you think about, you know, uh, what the alternative of what the alternative is, 850,000 wind turbines doesn't seem that much. So um, I, I think, okay, with current research, it doesn't seem like a very feasible uh, project to complete, but with research, you know, going forward, is there an alternative? Is there something that we can come up with? Can we improve research enough to, um, to make uh, the, the project much easier to complete? Interesting. Thank you, Natalie. We have now two questions, one from the Da Vinci climate team and one from Space Time, that they are both related with media. Um, how can we encourage the media to be realistic about the way they report on climate change? And how could we help scientists in their dissemination mission on climate issue and global warming? Okay, so um, I think uh, one of the major problems in this area is uh, terminology. So um, a scientist has been doing research for uh, quite some time in some instances. And when they're talking to news reporters and news reporters relaying information back to the public, they often use uh, difficult words and terminology uh, that uh, most people don't understand, most people that haven't been working in that field for that amount of time. And one example I can think of is um, uh, the 100 year flood. So uh, if you're uh, unfamiliar with what that term means, then you might assume something that, oh, this flood shouldn't happen for another 100 years. But it's not. It's a term that uh, scientists use to um, uh, sort of measure the magnitude of a flood. So it's, it's a flood that you would expect to happen one in every 100 years. So uh, it has a 1% chance of happening rather than this is 100 years off. So um, it's, it's very easy for information to, to get confused like that down, down the line. So um, what, what I think, um, and we're seeing this increasingly, is public demand for information. So the, the public are now taking control of, of, of certain things and they're demanding information regarding these things. And what this will mean is that the news will have to be delivered in a more effective way and to be the best news channel you have to have the best explanations for these things and this will um filter downstream so that the scientists will have to provide this information and the news reporter will have to understand this so that they can meet public demand so i think keep pushing for information keep demanding um to get the the right information and accurate results yes. Very interesting. Thank you, Natalie. So we have now a different question. So Tim Mission K from UK uh, asked if we can suggest some different uses for food wastes. Do you have any suggestions, Natalie? Um, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, just a little bit of context regarding food waste. So uh, food waste is a, a huge issue as well, right? Because a third of all food is actually wasted. So uh, everywhere, food everywhere, a third of it is wasted. So, um, and it actually accounts for 8% of um, uh, human greenhouse gases. So uh, the greenhouse gases that are released by humans. So uh, we can see that as an issue because not only um, is, it, is it a waste of the energy used to produce it and the water used to produce it, food that's um, wasting away in landfill is actually given off these greenhouse gases. So it's a big problem that can actually be tackled and it seems like a relatively obvious one so um the 
we, you could be more clever with your your planning so or everybody could be more clever with their planning so you buy the bare minimum um you can freeze food obviously a freezer that's powered with clean energy um composting or making jams and preservatives rather than you know throwing certain foods away um but uh uh you know creating awareness as well i think again is is key in these kinds of things because people don't uh, aren't being responsible with their food waste and they don't really know uh, ways in which they can do this um one thing i've noticed is uh, uh, movements towards this. So um, we see quite a lot of restaurants that have zero waste policies. Um, and that they, they are being uh, responsible with their own food waste um, with those various things, but also sourcing their food responsibly. So um, there's something called wonky foods. So I'm just gonna use this as an example. So um, a lot of food that's, that's produced in agriculture isn't perfect it's it comes out wonky and this food isn't sold because um once upon a time the public weren't interested in having food that didn't look perfect or, or it just didn't because companies assumed that it wouldn't be sold I, we don't know but um these these were thrown out they were wasted so these restaurants are actually sourcing wonky food so it is it is helping in um reducing that food waste um, um, another, another thing I've seen, which mostly involves uh, fats and greases, um, rendering is an example. We're taking uh, liquid, liquid fats and producing things like cosmetics um, uh, and soaps, for instance. And these companies actually provide um, a free, free barrels and pickup service. So that's one way. Um, uh, fats and oils are also used to uh, produce uh, biodiesel. So uh, alternative to certain fuels, so reducing greenhouse gases as well as wasting your, your food responsibly. Um, and anaerobic digesters. So um, this is using fats, oils and grease to uh, in water waste treatment plants um, by creating um, uh, renewable uh, forms of energy and biogas. Thank you, Natalie. Great suggestions, and it's really good for always, always to be aware of what we can do also with this kind of food waste. Uh, we have one more question that is from the climate team. They are asking, how can we doing sport contribute to monitor climate? Mm -hmm. Any suggestions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. This is good. I like uh, a lot of this uh, efficient. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, the example I'm showing you here. Uh, is an example from the uh, the ESA website. Uh, this is an example how uh, of how um, surfers have uh, been creative in combining sport with uh, climate change monitoring. So these surfers have been equipped with GPS trackers and um, a, a thermal sensor, and they've gone out to do their surfing as they usually would, and they're taking sea surface temperature. So measurements of sea surface temperature. Now we've got satellites that can do that, uh, but of course around the coastal regions, now imagine how high up your satellite is. It's taking sea surface measurements of most of the ocean, but, um, which, is, which is okay, but at the coastal regions where it's more dynamic and the resolution needs to be smaller. Remember I mentioned the grid cells. So if you have smaller grid cells, that's a smaller resolution. Um, uh, this is what we require on the coastal regions and it's impossible for satellites to get accurate regions at those areas. Now if you send out loads of mini satellites in the form of surfers, if you like, um, and uh, they're taking these, these temperatures, that data will complement what the satellites are seeing and you've got a much more accurate picture um, for, for, what, for what the sea surface temperature is and of course we like accuracy when we have our climate models. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, we are getting to the end of the webinar. And yes, I think we have some activity in the chat. Uh, I would say that perhaps we have time just for one more question, Vera. OK, so um, there was the question, is it possible to stop climate change in under 60 years? Um, uh, that's that's a, a difficult one for me to answer. but. Um, I, I would say it is possible, um, but this this will require a very, very drastic change. 
Now, the way um, infrastructure is set up at the moment, the way economies work um, and the way governments are positioned, a change like that within 60 years is almost impossible, but um, not impossible. It just will require um, a lot of money and uh, a lot of change to take place very, very quickly. Yes. Thank you very much, Natalie. We are really getting close to, to the end of this webinar. Unfortunately, we will not have time to, to answer more questions. But for all the teams that they have questions that we were not able to answer here, we really encourage you to send us an email to climatedetectives at isa.int and we'll try to answer as many questions uh, as possible. Uh, so thank you, Natalie, for, for this great talk. So we have learned so much uh, during this one hour. Very so we have talked about weather and climate, uh, how we can investigate climate and climate change, and also what we can all do uh, to help lessen climate change. We have heard about greenhouse effect, global warming. So it's a lot of complex topics uh, that some of our climate detectives teams are, are investigating. So once again, thank you, Natalie, for, for this amazing talk. Mm -hmm. Would you like to send a final message to, to our teams? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have been part of, of this project. And, and it's really nice to see you know, uh, the youth of today taking their future into their own hands and, you know, being really proactive in these uh, clear and present dangers. So uh, well done. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm truly thankful to be part of it and carry on and good luck. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, it was really good to, to receive so many questions, a lot of interest that we have received from all of you, from all the different teams. Thank you once again to join the webinar. We wish all the climate detectives all the best for their investigations. And don't forget, we can all make a difference. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Natalie, once again. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.